Well, what an introduction. Thank you. Um, it's an incredible honour and pleasure to be here. Um, it's a real honour and pleasure and privilege um, to be asked by graduate students, to be asked by trainees to come and speak. And I don't get that very often. I get asked to do a lot of talks to a lot of different audiences. But to have uh, what I would consider the next generation ask me to come and talk to them um, is hugely, hugely um, uh, gratifying. And I'm deeply, deeply grateful. Um, thank you, Daphne, for that introduction. It takes courage to start talking about some uncomfortable things. It's not easy to do um, at more junior levels of, of traineeship. But I really um, admire and applaud the courage that I've seen amongst many uh, young, particularly researchers, young scientists in Canada. And, uh, and Daphne, you're to be applauded. And thank you for that. I appreciate it. Um, just to, that's a sign that I need to stop talking. We'll start, start my talk. Um, just to get a sense of who's in the room, uh, how many people in the room are members of UBC, whether it be faculty, staff, or, or students, okay. And how many people are community members, maybe other people from other parts of Vancouver, a few other institutions, and there was one over there. <laughs> um, okay, and how many people, I, predominantly my background is in science, how many people in science? Oh, okay, so we've got quite a lot of scientists, okay. So, um, so I'm going to talk about um, embracing dimensions. I'm going to explain why that's the title a little bit later on. Um, as you can see, I'm uh, at Ryerson University in chemistry and biology. I'm an affiliate scientist at St. Michael's Hospital where my research lab is focused. I love social media, so you can, uh, you can stalk me on the interwebs there. Um, we have a website where a lot of resources are compiled and pooled, which has become a bit of a national resource in this area, EDI particularly in STEM, that being science, technology, engineering, and math. And I'm also vice president of my sort of disciplinary science society, which is the Canadian Society for Molecular Biosciences. So when you're talking about or giving a talk, um, when I'm giving a talk, actually anywhere in the world, and I've given talks in Australia, the UK, the US just last week, um, I always acknowledge where my work is done. And we had the land acknowledgement for this location, but it's really important that I acknowledge where I do my work. And that is Ryerson in downtown Toronto. And Toronto is in the dish with one spoon territory. That is a treaty which bound the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, and the Mississaugas to uh, share the territory and protect the land. This is our official land acknowledgement for my institution. These are living documents. Subsequent indigenous nations and peoples, Europeans and all newcomers, have come into this treaty. And it says invited, but I don't think everybody was invited. And so we're updating this as we understand more and we become more and more self-aware about actually our relationship with First, Nation, First Nations as colonial people, as a settler I am, as, as I am. I'm an immigrant. I'm a proud immigrant. You can tell from my accent. I tell students that I went to Hogwarts. <laughs> uh, um, I'm a proud immigrant, but I have white skin, white privilege. So I'm not that immigrant that you hear a lot about, particularly in, in sort of rabid political discourse right now. So um, this is our land acknowledgement. There is our um, wonderful Aboriginal elder, Joanne Delaire, and she's holding the wampum belt. And I use this picture as an example of the value of bringing in other ways of thinking about how we might do something. That is the treaty that she's got there. It's an object with symbolism, deep, deep, complex symbolism. We think of treaties, we think of governance structures in the sort of European context, which is parchments written with quill pens in French or English. You would have to be able to read or speak those languages. But this is a different way of thinking about a governance structure. If you understood, understood the symbolism, you could understand what you had all agreed to. So it's another way of thinking about how do we bring communities together? How do we think about governance? How can we think about it in a different way? the value of bringing different perspectives together. The land acknowledgements are calls to action. And this is really, really important. They are not ceremonial boxes to check off. Um, and they should never, ever be treated that way. They are a call to action. So what is your call to action? And I challenge everybody when I'm giving a talk, 
wherever I'm giving a talk, about what the call, what is the call to action? What are you going to do in response to the land acknowledgement and in response to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission uh, recommendations? And my response is to share the platform, to share the platform and amplify the voices, particularly of women who otherwise don't get heard or don't get seen. And that can be Aboriginal women, like Melanie Goodchild in the middle here, who was actually the person that told me um, to use my privilege to share the platform. That was exactly her words, share the platform, when we were, I invited her to be on a panel with me. She's an indigenous scholar, she's Anishinaabe, and she's working with NASA on their massive geospatial data sets to see if they can do predictions about uh, vulnerability, particularly for First Nations in response to climate change. So you can see ethical knowledge co-creation with indigenous people. Um, possibly as climate change uh, impacts more um, seriously and, and severely to First Nations communities, then food sources um, and safe travel routes might shift. And NASA has this big geospatial data set, and Mulaney is a social scientist, uh, particularly in areas of sort of water governance, and so that's what she's doing. She's quite brilliant. She's probably the most brilliant person I've ever met. Um, and so, uh, so I, I celebrate her, and I want you to know about her, because you probably haven't heard about her. Um, other women that we don't hear about, women of color, particularly in sciences. So there's Dr. Juliet Daniel, who is a geneticist, and her background, her perspective as a woman from the Caribbean, informs and, and helps uh, generate ideas around her research. And she's discovered a genetic risk factor for women of African Caribbean ancestry, um, which is a risk factor for those women with triple negative breast cancer. So her background, her perspective, her experience has informed her research, and she's discovered something that perhaps wouldn't have been discovered by other people. And Eugenia Duodo is the executive director of an organization called Visions of Science, and she has a fabulous, very powerful TEDx talk that you might want to look at, which describes her experience as the only woman of color in her graduate program at the University of Toronto in chemistry. So she went into chemistry as a PhD student. She was the only woman of color. And what it felt like to go into the lab or to go into her program classes or whatever and not see herself represented anywhere in that program, despite it being in downtown Toronto, where 70% of my classes, 70% of Toronto, undergraduates come from what we would call, perhaps inappropriately, racialized um, communities. Minoritized, not minority, they are my minoritized, they're actually a majority. And so she's very uh, um, eloquent and very um, um, successful. Um, she completed her PhD and she now runs an organization that provides opportunities, science opportunities for marginalized youth. And she describes the frustration that she experiences when people talk about what are we going to do with young men of color, get them off the streets, and how if only we could come up with something a bit more creative than yet another after-school basketball program, because we have these stereotypes. So that's my, uh, in my individual personal call to uh, action. But an institution can make a call to action, and I've been talking to physicists a lot for some reason over the last couple of months, and so um, this was actually something I put together in, um, when I talked to the McDonald Institute, which is based at Queen's, which is an institute built after Art McDonald won the Nobel Prize in particle physics. It's the McDonald Institute, so it's a, it's a trans-Canada um, institute in particle physics. What are you going to do in terms of your commitment to equity, diversity, and inclusion and your response to the, uh, to the uh, TRC? There are things you can do, and there are things that people are doing in other countries. So indigenous astronomy, why do we learn constellations that are Greco-Roman? There is a rich uh, history and uh, culture around indigenous astronomy. Why, why aren't we um, mobilizing that? You could do that as an, as an organization, as an institution. And you need to be aware of these things. And if you think that science, and I'm going to focus on science because it's my discipline more than the other disciplines, if you think that science or things that happen in the academy are going on um, independently of what's happening in society, and particularly scientists and engineers seem to struggle with this a bit, I would say you're not paying attention because science and engineering exists within a cultural context. It exists within society. And this is just on the right here, a picture from 
a news article about the, the TMT, the 30 meter telescope in Hawaii. There is a lot of um, trauma around the placement of that particular globally relevant telescope in, on indigenous, indigenously important um, land in Hawaii. So it doesn't really matter what discipline you're in, even physics and math, you know, where they tend to think they're sort of you know, big, big thoughts and everything's happening within a cultural context. So even an institution can have a response, a call to action to the TRC. So this is me. This is what people know me as or see me as now. And I have had, um, I have had a lot of privilege. I've had a lot of advantages. Um, and I am a scientist, a successful scientist. I put this up here because sometimes when you do this kind, I put these two um, papers up here because sometimes when you do this work, particularly in science, I would say, STEM, uh, people, the system sort of tends to view it a bit as uh, you, you couldn't make it as a scientist. So now you're doing science outreach or doing public engagement or you're doing science policy. You're not a serious scientist. I used to hear this about David Suzuki back when I was a graduate student at UVic you know, 100 years ago. Like, he wasn't a proper scientist anymore because he was dying, doing science communication. And it never made any sense. It's like, these are valid, rigorous, demanding contributions. Um, but there's still a bit of an attitude there. So yeah, I'm actually a pretty good scientist, pretty respectable. I got my grants, I got one of the biggest grants, you know, in my section at NSERC. So. Um, and I sit on, there I am, pretending to find a cure for cancer. <laughs> totally staged shot there, I have no idea what I'm holding. Um, and uh, a bit of a global citizen, traipsed around the Western Hemisphere a bit, um, and, you know, I have had, a, I am having a very good career, I've had, well, past tense, present, present tense. Um, but like everybody else, I started out from somewhere, I came from somewhere, and as you can see here, clearly I was the world's most beautiful baby. Um, and um, where I came from has informed who I am. So people say, why do you do this EDI stuff when you're a successful scientist? Like, why, why is that? Why, why, you know, how, where did that come from? That's a very good question. Why is a scientist being such a, um, you know, a present a a advocate for these issues? And it's because of where I come from. It's because of the values I was raised with. So while I sound like I went to school at Hogwarts, and I did indeed grow up just outside of Cambridge, my parents were first generation uh, university graduates, and here they are, uh, 1954, I think, in borrowed clothes, because they both came from very, the fancy party, they both came from very poor, humble backgrounds. My mother from the slums of uh, northeast England, mining country, my father from middle England, sort of rural area, and both of them had the opportunity to go to university only because there was legislated change in the education system. So they both came from very low socioeconomic sectors of society. None of my grandparents finished high school. Um, and so they had a very strong awareness of the importance and power of education and the value of education, the importance of equity, which is fairness, that people who, who have um, capability should have opportunity, um, of accessibility, because they had the opportunity to go to university when other people would not have been able to, um, and social justice. That was, what I, that was how I was raised, I was informed, that informed my view of the world. So a very strong sense of what's fair, who's not in the room, who's not getting the chance to do some of the things that maybe they want to do. And so, you know, men could go to university in Britain for hundreds and hundreds of years, but they had to be rich and white. So my father got to go to university because there was a legislated change in the education system, which removed a barrier. So when we're talking about accessibility and intersections and characteristics, socioeconomic barriers are very significant. And Daphne and I were talking earlier about um, uh, scholarships that evaluate um, travel experiences, I think. How much have you traveled globally? Well, there's a huge privilege associated with the ability to travel. I stopped taking volunteers in my lab because if you can volunteer in my lab, it means you don't have to work during the summer or whatever, there's a huge privilege associated with that. If I take somebody in my lab to work, they're going to get paid to do that. So socioeconomic barriers are very real, and we tend to not think about them so much in, in Canada because we have this sort of sense that we're such a, you know, a great society compared to other places. But when there are barriers in accessibility to education, to human endeavors, then those barriers 
determine who gets to be involved, who gets to participate. They, in, they determine who gets to make decisions, and they can be decisions about policy, they can be decisions about housing, they can be decisions about transit, they can be decisions about health care. It, it determines who gets to ask questions, who gets to develop technology. And we see some, some really classic examples of huge, massive technology fails, because the people that have been involved in technology development have not been diverse and inclusive. So my values were very much, who's not in the room? When I was about seven years old, I went to this, I was in this little co-ed primary school just outside of Cambridge. And uh, the girl, and it was class, the girls were rounded up. It's about, like, I don't know, 15, of a, 15 girls, 15 boys. Girls were rounded up and, and sent off to sewing lessons. And the boys were rounded up and sent off, I think, to woodworking, but I didn't know because I didn't get to go. And I was about seven, and I thought, that doesn't make sense. It makes no sense. They could have been like short people and tall people or green eyes and blue. There's no basis for that. And so I was very aware that there were sort of decisions that were being made that had no rational basis except that somebody said, you need to do that. And you, oh, you look like that. You need to go do that. And so that's my, my, my sort of worldview. But I was always very curious. I was like all children, very curiosity driven and grew up wanting to discover the world and wanting to be like Jacques Cousteau, who I saw on the TV all the time, or or actually more like Freya Stark. Anybody know who Freya Stark is? The anthropologist? Yeah. Um, Freya Stark or Gertrude Bell, who were women in that sort of British early 20th century tradition who, who challenged paradigms and challenged sort of conventions and dressed up like men and traipsed across North Africa and were really accomplished and, and discovered new things. Um, and that's what I wanted to do. And growing up outside of Cambridge, um, we obviously, we're close to the university. My, my parents weren't, didn't work there or anything having to do with it, but um, there was a place, there's a place called the British Antarctic Survey, and it's a very well-established, kind of famous research centre based at Cambridge, but has a station at the South Pole. And I thought this was the most exotic, uh, exciting thing that could possibly happen. I wanted to go work there. I want, that was my goal. I wanted to be an environmental scientist and go to this like, remote, crazy location and like, study the sky or something. And uh, when I was about 12, my father took me to an open house there, and so I was very excited because this was my dream, and I bounced up to a table that was being manned by a very bored-looking person, and I said, um, so I'm really, it's really, really interesting, how many women do you have working at the South Pole? And he said in a very dismissive way, oh, it's a really stressful environment, and we don't want to add to that stress by putting women there, so there are no women working at the South Pole. So this massive door slammed shut said, you can't do that because you're a girl. No sense. Uh, indignation, and my father was kind of outraged as well. And it's like, makes no sense. And the loss of talent and the loss of um, you know, opportunity is very real. It's a barrier because somebody had a policy, even if it was an unofficial policy, that said, you know, on basis of really nothing, that um, no data, that this was the way they were going to run things. So informed my view of the world, and in spite of that, then obviously I managed to become a, a successful scientist, and my curiosity was still very much um, um, fulfilled by becoming a scientist uh, in a different kind of area. I'm, I'm really a biochemist or biologist. Um, but I have a rich experience, which also informs my, my work, my view, my questions that I ask. I am a research scientist, I'm an academic leader, I'm an advocate, I've helped develop policy at federal and local levels, I sit on various boards, I've been described as an activist, although I think, just wait, because I'm only getting started. Um, <laughs> I'm a mother, a daughter, I think that's really important that you can be a scientist and be a full human being. And enough with this myth that you have to juggle and choose between children and a career. No, we create an environment that is humane for everybody who wants to be a full and rich human being. If I hadn't done science, I would have done music. Um, I like dogs more than cats, that's important. I'm a rich, rich and complex human being, and that's brought me to, to where I am as a scientist. But it's also brought me an acquired expertise in the areas of equity, diversity, and inclusion. And I write and speak and advise on this a lot. So this is you know, a good 30, 40 years worth of experience um, contributing to this debate, particularly in Canada, but, but in, informed by my experience and my knowledge of what's going on in other parts of the world. 
So it's really important to understand that barriers to access and barriers to education opportunity are very real, but they may be invisible. How many people have seen this cartoon before? Yeah, I hate this cartoon. <laughs> um, I'm putting it up here because I think you need to understand why it's problematic. It, well, it's, it's framed around a deficit model. The short people need, a, need to stand on something. Um, to see over the fence. We're not talking about people who are, have a deficit in some aspect. So really, the, the only panel that we should be looking at is people who are all the same height, but some of them are in trenches and some of them are on, some of them are on piles of boxes. They all are the same, sight, uh, same height. It's as if some people have tailwinds. It's not to say that if you come from that dominant group, which is usually, but not always, white, middle-class, straight men, not always, but if you come from that group, that's not to say that you won't have things that will have been a problem, but they probably almost certainly won't be because of the, your color or your gender. So you have tailwinds. I have tailwinds because I'm white and I have privilege, so it's easier for me. But yes, I'm a woman, so no, they don't send women to the South Pole, so, so some headwinds. If you're a young white ma gay man in tech, it can be really challenging, more headwinds, so it's more challenging. If you're a woman of color in science, it can be very challenging, significant headwinds. So it's not a question of having a deficit, it's a question of the, there being barriers. And we need to recognize this, first of all. We need to be honest about it. This is the discomfort that Daphne was referring to. There are real barriers. They exist. There is racism and homophobia and sexism in Canada, in the academy, and it's a problem. People of equal or superior ability are blocked from participating. If one of my requirements for a job is that you two people finish a marathon, I'm not saying you have to race each other. What size shoes do you have? Uh, and yours? Okay, so if I give you both Canadian 10 size shoes and I say finish that marathon, that's equality. I've given you the same thing, but I'm giving you what you need. You need shoes that fit you. You need shoes that fit you, right? That's equity. You need to give people what they need and recognize the barriers and get them out of the way. So inequities are structural and systemic. There is prejudice and bias, and there are stereotypes, and people who have power and privilege often don't want to give it up. Now, we think in Canada, it's like, oh, but that all happens in other places. That's like the US or it's like, you know. The reality is we have a long history of sexism and racism, homophobia in Canada. Anybody familiar with the Gordon Freeman story at university here yeah, of uh, Alberta? So in 1989, Gordon Freeman, who was full professor in chemistry at the University of Alberta, published this peer-reviewed article in a publicly funded Canadian journal of physics, a journal issue that was dedicated to a conference proceedings. Okay, he's a chemistry professor, journal of physics, conference proceedings in physics, peer reviewed by, allegedly by the, uh, sent out by the editor who was Rafe Nichols at York University, under the title sociology. Already it's like, mm, it's a bit odd, but okay. And it's got a science kind of title, Kinetics of Non-Homogeneous Processes in Human Society, Unethical Behavior and Societal Bias, Societal Chaos. Um, it's actually, the, the question he's asking is actually a legitimate question, social science. The question he's asking is, why, is there an, why do we see an increase in cheating amongst grad, undergraduates over time? Now, that's a legitimate question, and it is a question that is asked by people who do research into pedagogy. Um, and there are, there's actually a recent um, uh, article that came out in the UK um, that correlates um, increased incidents with things like anxiety and debt load and parental expectations and those kinds of things. But what he did was he said, I've seen this happening over my last 30 years of teaching chemistry and, it's a, you know, and I want to find out why. And so what he did was he brought students into his office one by one, sat them down and let them talk and discovered that more of them who had mothers who worked outside the home admitted to maybe cheating than others who didn't. Now, the ethical issue, I mean, he's talking about unethical behavior. That is absolutely, what he did is amongst the most unethical things that you can do in terms of human participants' research ethics. 
Um, it's, the, this scholarship is dreadful. I actually gave this paper to my critical thinking in biomedical sciences class to do a critical analysis. Um, but it got it published. And, um, you know, it's, you can go read it. It's still up there. You can go read it. Increased incidence of cheating on university exams is due largely to the decay of the traditional stable families. Women who work outside the home contribute to the moral degeneration of children. But I feel like I have to pull so that I clutch, you know. Um, so, and he's a full professor. Now, there was a lot of furore in academia at the time. The National Research Council, Canadian Science Publishing, who published it, um, were very nervous. The universities. The University of Alberta was told that they should do something. They didn't want to do it. Nobody wanted to really touch it. It was, it was uncomfortable and icky um, and difficult. And eventually he retired. And the person who was the editor of the journal, Rafe Nichols, got the Order of Canada. The people who worked in that department, Department of Chemistry at the University of Alberta, were affected. They were impacted. This is an example of climate, the climate of a department. Margaret Anna Moore was a... Uh, chemistry professor there, and sat very sadly, she died earlier this year, but she described to me, when I talked to her last year about this, going in and having heated arguments with him. In fact, there were heated discussions in departmental meetings. In fact, it created a culture where people didn't want to go to work, where people were uncomfortable. Now, can you imagine being a female undergraduate or a female graduate student, and there, are, you know, there weren't any female professors, virtually, in this department. So we have, and this is an egregious example, this is a very explicit bias. And he, you know, he never changed. And we have other examples of racism. This just was a story that came out recently. Queens um, has, has acknowledged that they had some horribly racist behavior in their medical schools earlier in the 20th century, where students of color who were actually enrolled in med school were asked to leave. Can you leave? Because sentiments had changed in the community post um, First World War. And they now have acknowledged that. Um, and they're actually teaching this. So the self-awareness has come to the point where we're going to admit that we have this, this was going on, and we're going to understand it, and we're going to learn from it, and we're going to recognize where that came from. So it's sexism and racism, and these things can be built into power structures. They're built into policies around who gets to go to university, who gets to stay, who feels comfortable working there, who's told to leave. You have to leave med school at Queen's because of the color of your skin. It's in Canada. It sets the cultural tone and climate for a department and an institution. And, and this is what we're talking about when we're talking about what are we going to do in the academy around equity, diversity, and inclusion. And you might think, well, that's a long time ago. We're much better than we were. And it's true. That's 1989. But I gave a talk to some medical physicists, big organization conference last year. And it was written up in, an, in a newsletter. Somebody sent me the newsletter. And so 30 years later, here we are, January 29. And, you know, look at these students. This is what my medical physics program at Ryerson looks like. That's what downtown Toronto looks like. This is what Canada looks like, in, at least in the big urban centers. This is, you know, this is who we are training, brilliant young people. In that newsletter is an article by Rowan Thompson from uh, Carlton. She's Canada Research, Canada Research Chair, talking about an experience that she had. This is reported from last year. When Donna Strickland from University of Waterloo was awarded the Nobel Prize, when she heard another of her, heard one of her colleagues remarking his surprise that a world-class renowned male optics expert had been overlooked, quote, maybe because he was not a woman. So this is recent. This is explicit. He said this out loud. He said this out loud to a colleague. He said this out loud to a colleague. It's, Appalling in the academy, shocking. This is a microaggression. This creates a tone and a culture. That this, this is one more chipping away at your credibility, at your um, right to be there, at your um, value of your contributions. And this is current. So we hear a lot about women in science, and you know Donna Strickland is asked to give a lot of talks about women in science. She's not, she's not an expert. She has a lived experience. Um, but she's not, not an expert in sort of gender inequities and that kind of thing. So this is something I do a lot. And I have to explain to and remind people that women in science are not a single homogeneous group. So we hear a lot about white women in science, but it's really important to remember that, you know, it's the, the tailwinds that I've had here in my EDI coat, you can see, I only have one outfit. Um, <laughs> um, 
And the tailwinds I've had are completely different to the tailwinds that, or the headwinds that Melanie Goodchild has experienced. She's so much smarter than I am. But and, you know, she speaks indigenous ways of knowing and she speaks Western ways of knowing. She can talk to you about Descartes and she can talk to you about Foucault. And then she can talk to you about Anishinaabe ways of thinking about the, the world and the fact that there's no word that distinguish, distinguishes humans from nature. Like it's all part of one thing. Unbelievable. But the experience she's had quite different from mine. And this is Shohini Ghosh, who is one of the few women of color computer science or, or physics professors in Canada. I think there's like nine of them or something. Maybe you know, Sarah, there's not very many. Uh, and she talks about how, to, how she discovered her superpower as she was going through her career. So she started out in school with girls and boys, taking physics, and, and then it, you know, she, then she went to master's and PhD, and then she was like five girls in the class, and then one girl in the class. And a professor would come in, just like in the movie Hidden Figures, he would come into the front of the room and he would say, good morning, gentlemen, and she would be sitting there. And she said, I discovered my superpower was invisibility become more and more invisible. And ex the, what she experienced, has experienced, again, is different from what I've experienced. And this is Hilary Lappin Scott, who is, uh, was a senior pro-vice chancellor of a big university in the UK, who spoke on this panel about issues around how women are treated as they get older, age, and how differences between, oh, you know, women have to uh, prove, continually prove, whereas men are hired on their potential, that kind of thing. And it's interesting, I didn't know this until recently, although Hillary and I have been friends for a while, um, she also had an aspiration to go work at the British Antarctic Survey. She's a microbiologist, and then she also was told, no, we don't hire women. So here are two accomplished scientists, academic leaders, um, very successful individuals who've made significant contributions that that organization lost out on. They could have hired both of us. We both had aspirations. So it's not just women in science that we have to be thinking about intersectionalities. But we live in a world where there are stereotypes about everybody. So, oh, let me go back because I missed my data. So there's, you know, all of us. And this is just a, a random photo that somebody took. And there's my colleague Mahadeo Sukai. So Mahadeo is an immigrant. He is brown-skinned. He is blind. He has a PhD in molecular genetics from the University of Toronto. And he's the director of research and accessibility at the Canadian National Institute for the Blind. Pretty smart guy. Um, and he literally wrote the book, there it is, there he is in much younger days, uh, wrote the book on a creating a culture of accessibility in the sciences. And if we look at data, people with disabilities are the most underemployed group in Canada. Huge potential, lots of smart people, but we make judgments about them. We all do it, we're all biased, we all come from cultural backgrounds and, and conditioning. Um, if Stephen Hawking there, who used to, used to see trundling across Cambridge at high speed, very alarming. Um, if he had started out in a wheelchair, we probably never would have uh, realized what a brilliant brain he had. But he started out as able-bodied and became disabled. So we had a chance to access that because we make assumptions about people. But if you're developing medical devices and technology, and you know, as people age, we're going to need more of that kind of thing, then you need people with that kind of experience and perspective and insight as part of your team in terms of development. Um, and this one that I've got circled here was a tweet that came out just before the gender summit that was hosted in Canada two years ago, where um, one of the funding agencies, NSERC, put this out um, because I was on a plenary national leader on the issue of equity, diversity, and inclusivity in STEM. And my colleague and friend, um, Anthony Bonato, who was a very successful mathematician, uh, highly regarded, full professor, responded um, to this tweet saying, as a gay mathematician, I was always on the outside. I never had role models or advocates, I think it says advocates, um, in my career, and now I do. Because I, as a dean at that time, said this is a priority. We are going to make sure that we build EDI into what we do at this faculty, in this faculty. And it was kind of heartbreaking because he has, he is, you know, he's probably 50, in his career, by the time he reached full professor, still felt like he didn't belong, didn't fit in. Couldn't bring his authentic self, couldn't bring his full self to work, couldn't fully contribute all of his talents. And that story is repeated over and over again. I heard recently from a young man in pharmacology who has been living his life in a very guarded way, says, you know, when I came in on a Monday morning to my lab, I would have to think about 
how we were, how, when people started talking about what did you do on the weekend, he was always having to censor himself. And finally, he came out to his, his lab, to his PI, to his supervisor, um, and finally, he could be his authentic self. And you know, he could live like who he really was. And Anthony, this year, was asked to chair a major conference in his field, um, a section of a major conference in his field, which is very prestigious. It's the kind of thing that you put on a grant application or you put on a CV, invited chair, major conference. People give awards. It goes to value, to your merit. But it was located, the conference was located in St. Petersburg. So he's not, he said, I'm not going. I don't feel safe. I cannot go. So... He's recognized for his contributions, but he can't be his, his full self. And that's going to cost something, right? When we have these assessments of people based on things like, you know, where did you go? You know, international talks, you know, tenure and promotion. How many international talks have you been invited to give? Conferences have you chaired? Well, you know, we know that that's biased. I'm not going to give you all the data. Sometimes I get challenged, like, prove it to me. Well, I'm not going to prove to you that the, the world is round. I'm not going to prove to you that evolution is real. I'm not going to prove to you that anthropogenic climate change is a fact, um, because it's not my job. So if you want to find out more, and you want all the data and the evidence and the massive body of scholarship in support of the very real things like unconscious bias, challenges to fair assessment, barriers to access in, for instance, science, then this is an excellent, excellent primer put together for the Faculty of Medicine at U of T by May Diane Andrade, who has a position in EDI. She's also a Canada Research Chair in Biology, and Brian Gainsler, who's Director of the Dunlap Institute, which is an astrophysics center at uh, U of T. When we fail to provide access, when we fail to recognize barriers, get them out of the way, ensure that everybody is contributing and everybody is counted, we get bad science and we get bad medicine, we get bad medicine, we get bad scholarship. Tons and tons of examples of this. The expert in this area around gendered innovation is Londa Scheibinger at Stanford. She has a whole lab dedicated to, a whole research program dedicated to gendered innovations. And she will, you can go there and you can find out all sorts of case studies. This is one example that came out of Canada. Heart disease kills mostly women, so why, aren't they ex why are they excluded from drug trials? We have a horrible issue around appropriate sex and gender-based analysis in things like drug trials, in things like genome-wide association studies, in things like technology development. And when that happens, sometimes people die. Everybody's heard, I think, probably of the um, airbag um, story in cars that were designed for a very standard sized person, a standard male sized person, and uh, women and children died because those airbags were not calibrated for the range that humanity exists in. So inclusive design is good for everybody. And inclusive design comes from actually building in inclusion and equity into your systems. And in fact, when you do that, you get better everything. You get better governance. You get better security. You get better technology. You get better outputs. You get better board, corporate board behavior. Good Lord, we need some of that. Um, and this is the president of the World Bank from last year saying that human capital brain power is the most important resource that developed countries have. It's going to account for most of the growth in developed countries. Not developing countries, but developed countries. Human intellect is our most important resource. We tend to think of Canada as mining or it's forestry or you know, maybe it's AI. I don't know. That's you know, lots of problems there. Um, but it's human capital. And we are a small population, very, very small population in a big country. Small population who are competing against very big countries, the US, China, the European Union. So we cannot afford to lose any human capital. And when I hear continually, week, month, year after year, of stories of brilliant young people dropping out, particularly of science and technology and engineering, because that's my area, continually, I have binders of stories, uh, it really, really concerns me because we're losing talent. So we need to use all of our, all our human capital for economic development. It gives us increased competitiveness, increased inno uh, innovation. We hear a lot about innovation. What does that actually mean? Design for innovation, truly. Inclusive design benefits everyone. 
So that's why we want to embrace all the dimensions of humanity, of human intellect, all the creativity, the curiosity, the abilities, because those things all drive good outputs. But we can't do that if we're going to hang on to these cultural approaches to what we think people should do or where they should go or the traditional ways of doing things. We have to challenge those things. We have to really look at our cultural climate um, issues. And the Canadian university system, the post-secondary university system, although we think it is, it is not a meritocracy. It is not a meritocracy. We are not hiring, promoting, recruiting, universally the best. We think that we are all about excellence, but we are not, because we have all of these systems that are biased. CV evaluations, letters of reference, socioeconomic barriers, um, inhumane uh, workplace policies, all sorts of things. And this is a book written by Canadian scholars, Melinda Smith, um, uh, well, so like Carl James, um, Howard Ramos, um, brilliant scholars, uh, is published by UBC Press. So, you know, you should be able to get a discount on it or something. <laughs> um, so we have issues in the academy here in Canada that we have to address. We have to be honest about that. Painful, icky, kind of difficult. People don't like to talk about these things. People would much rather, let's put on another mentoring program, or let's have a lunchtime brown bag series for, you know, students of, from LGBTQ or whatever. No, that doesn't work. What we need is evidence-informed, data-driven, I don't say um, evidence-based, because policies are, policies are informed by evidence. Policy-making is complex. Evidence-informed, data-driven policy changes that address organizational, institutional, structural, and systemic barriers to full EDI in STEM. Now, this is from my, my EDI in STEM talks, but ED, for full EDI in Canadian post-secondary education sector. You can tie this to dollars to incentivize behavior. This is already being done in the Canadian system through the Canada Research Chairs, the Canada Excellence Research Chairs. The only way to really get universities to do something is to sort of dangle money in front of them. Universities chase money, universities chase rankings. If you want to incentivize behavior, it's human nature, it's behavioral economics. It is what gets things done. So move towards where you need to be, show the behaviors that we know from evidence and data actually affect change, and then you will be rewarded. You have to do all of this based on data, both quantitative data and qualitative data. Quantitative data, for sure, we can count numbers, but qualitative data is really important and really rigorous and really valuable. And we need more of it. We can look to leading practices in other places. What works in other places? And importantly, we need leadership, education, intentionality, accountability. If you don't do it, it's going to cost you something. And courage. It takes a lot of courage to do these kinds of things because there is pushback. This is a good algorithm, awareness. We have a problem. We have a problem when I look at the leadership in Canadian post-secondary and I look at the people in my class or, you know, I look at the population and they don't seem to be kind of similar, like what's going on there? Not really represented. Lots of things we can look at. It's like awareness. We need education about what works because we need to look to see what works and apply that. Trouble is, we often jump from awareness to actions. So we've got a, pro a problem. Not enough girls in science. Not enough girls in science. What are we going to do? I know. We'll put on more science camps for little girls. Makes us feel all warm and fuzzy inside. And it absolves us of the responsibility of actually doing the work that we have to do because it's hard, painful work. So, awareness, education, and then actions based on what works, and then measurable outcomes, and iterate that. But this is what's been going on in other parts of the world. We think Canada's so progressive. We've just legalized marijuana. We're so progressive. No, <laughs> actually, we're not that progressive. So, the advanced program in the US has been going since 2001. $270 million have gone into that to evaluate at different institutions programming to sort of shift culture, particularly around gender, but they have data on everything so they can look at a whole variety of things. The Athena Swan program, strange name, long there's a history to why the name is that, but it's been going since 2005. It's an accreditation system, or an accreditation program. If you do the right things and shift the culture in your institution to one that's, for instance, family friendly, or one that maybe has changed its policies to take into account um, issues around uh, 
challenges for, for some communities, so invited talks or you know, expanding how we understand excellence. That's been going since, what, 2005. Sector-wide, um, it started off as a gender binary program. It's now been expanded to other kinds of intersectionalities. That program in the U UK was adopted by Australia. Every post-secondary institution in Australia signed on with about six, within about six months. The sector signed on to say, we want cultural institutional change. We want to make better institutions. We want to leverage all our human talent. They signed on, and they have been running a pilot for a couple of years. And this program now has been adopted, or adopted, adapted and adopted by the US, and it's called Sea Change. I sit on that in International Advisory Council. And again, it's an accreditation, adopting best practices, taking good data to set targets for change. They're focusing on a STEM focus there. The SAGE also started out as kind of binary STEM, they, um, binary gender STEM, uh, poorly constructed around their indigenous communities. So there are all sorts of things, well, well evaluated, well studied in terms of does this help? What's it all about? And I was just in uh, Washington last week at this uh, um, sea change meeting. So these are slides are taken with permission from um, people there. So this is Sarah from the UK. What's it about? It's about a commitment to remo removing barriers that contribute to underrepresentation. It's about taking a targeted approach to issues that may be of internal or external origin. It's about good practice and honesty. Self-reflection by institutions to say, you know what, I don't think we're doing a very good job in this program in chemistry at the University of Alberta where we have a culture of meanness. We're going to really address that and be honest about it and we're going to do something about it. I just picked on them just by random chance. Just because, yeah. It's not about hiring or promoting people because they're underrepresented. So I hear this from Vice President's research. Well, but we want to maintain the excellence. No, if you're not embedding equity you're not achieving excellence because you're missing people. So if you're saying we're going to select excellence on the basis of this narrow set of parameters and you're not going to take into account the fact that Anthony can't give an invited conference proceedings because he's not going to go to St. Petersburg, he might get killed. If you're not going to take that into account, your bar is lower. Go wider in terms of your excellence. Think more broadly. It's hard. I know it's hard. But harder work actually gives you better outputs. You'll get a higher bar. So it's about removing barriers, producing, and it's not about, um, so it's not about promoting on the basis of underrepresentation, not about uh, winning awards. Um, it's not about planning to suggest. Very good in Canada about this. Very good. Let's have another report. Let's have another, let's get together and talk about the problem. Let's get together and let's have a women in science symposium. Let's have a, you know, no. It's actually about what are you going to do next week when you sit down and you discuss what you want to negotiate, perhaps in your collective agreement. Oh, that's a scary thing, right? But it's, that's what it's about, doing stuff. And it's not about operating from a deficit model because some people lack ability and therefore we have to, you know, kind of give them a, a lift. Not that. Does it work? There was a report that just came out very recently, just published last week, that said, uh, yeah, when you start to do this, if you do it properly, there's strong evidence that the charter, you sign this Athena Swan charter, uh, the methodologies support cultural behavioral change, not just around gender equality, which is what they're focusing on, but around diversity in all of its forms. And interestingly, these are very clever people, and it's interesting, chemistry has been the leading discipline in the UK. Some very clever people. This is Tom Welton, who was the who's now was the dean of science at Imperial College London. So very prestigious, you know, their U15 kind of category. He's now the president of the Royal Society of Chemistry. Uh, he kept track of their numbers. He kept track of their metrics, all their traditional metrics, citations, how much money they brought in, number of publications, all those traditional things that measure excellence. So he kept track of them. Over the time, they in started to implement this cultural change. Family-friendly policies. We're not going to have departmental meetings unless they're between 10 and 4. We're going to look into part-time appointments to allow people to come back after elder care, child care, so that they can transition back into the workforce. All sorts of creative ways of thinking about things to create a more humane environment. 
And what he found was that the process had been incredibly helpful and it had increased their collaborative working, which led to their research volume increasing from 8 million pounds in 2007-8 to 13 million this year, Get, heading towards doubling their research output. So it's not about dumbing down or lowering the bar or, you know, it's actually creating a stronger output. Brian Gainsler at U of T and the Dunlap Institute has also implemented similar kinds of things, which he has the, the ability to do as a director of a, about 80 people. Uh, and he's tracking their citations and their research funding. And he's finding it's all going up as well. And they've increased the proportion of women in their staff and their graduate student population. Um, and by creating an environment that is humane and supportive and friendly, that is appropriate for them, because it all comes from self-reflection on what your system is and where your problems are, that, and you start to address that, they've created a more productive environment. Finally, Canada joined the gang and brought out a program that just was announced this year called Dimensions. And it's based on the same concept that we want to shift culture. So um, it's going to be supported by C-Change and Advance HG. And this actually, I think, has the, op the possibility of being best in the world because it cuts across all the disciplines, so it's not limited to STEM. We know that there are issues around gender equity in, in um, disciplines like philosophy and economics, lots of scholarship around that. We know that there are imbalances in other disciplines uh, where men feel like they are limited in their opportunities in nursing or education. Um, we've seen some interesting things happen when, we, we, when we've tackled that directly, intentionally, at, at Ryerson by in, in, um, encouraging men to come into those programs. And doing this work is difficult because it requires you to understand the nature of your climate, the nature of your institutional climate. And there are many aspects of climate that you need to understand. So again, it's not looking at fixing one group or targeting one community or saying, you need to work on this, or you need to lean in, or you need to try harder. It's actually about what kind of climate do we have, and how can we improve it? And how does climate show up? Well, it can be things like recognitions, or positive climate can be recognitions, opportunities, deliberate and transparent departmental meetings. The number of places in this country where it still is a case where faculty hires are not hired on the basis of the same set of questions that every person is interviewed against. Shocking, actually, that interview processes can be kind of a bit random, depending on, you know, which institution you're at. Not rigorous and um, e equitable. Um, departmental meetings that are held in um, transparent ways, sometimes with facilitated discussions. Work allocation is, um, work allocation is a huge issue. So workload is one of the issues often comes up in climate surveys. What is equitable workload? Is it transparent? Why are some people getting all of the graduate courses and other people getting undergraduate courses? It's come, it's come up in my department recently. How, who made that decision? How can we address that so that the people who are always getting loaded with those heavy lower level courses get to feel like they're being heard or there's a rotation through those sort of um, different kinds of uh, workload allocations? Negative indicators can be high scores on hostile harassment surveys. So there was a big survey that came out of the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine in the US last year. The National Academies did a massive climate survey. Now, we haven't got anything like this. I don't know what the National Academies, we don't have a National Academy, we're a Royal Academy. I'm not doing anything here. The National Academies in the US uh, discovered that harassment in science engineering and medicine in the US Academy was second only to the military. And about 58% women had a reported some level of harassment, which could be everything from microaggressions, uh, could be those comments, that kinds of comments that I um, showed you in response to Donna Strickland, there's little microaggressions chipping away, um, all the way to, to full scale um, physical assaults. But harassment surveys, Climate surveys, everybody needs to do a climate survey. You can do a climate survey just for small groups. You can do it for a lab, you can do it for a department, you can do it for a program. But finding out how people feel and if they feel respected, if they feel they can bring their full self to work is really important. It makes us all feel uncomfortable. Everybody feeling uncomfortable, you should feel uncomfortable. If you're not feeling uncomfortable, I'm not doing a good job. Discomfort is good. 
Now, there's this very Canadian thing where we don't want to be uncomfortable. We're very polite. Canadian characteristic, we're very polite, we're nice. Everybody says we're polite and nice. I guess a little passive aggressive myself, personally. But we don't want there to be conflict, okay? We don't want people to feel uncomfortable. But it's hard to deal with some of these things if you're not going to get uncomfortable. So we have to learn to get comfortable with being uncomfortable. And I think that's a little bit un-Canadian. So, and I've had conversations with Americans and Australians and they say, yeah, yeah, I think, I think that is a bit Canadian. You're gonna have a tough time there. So. But discomfort is actually really good. This is the work of Sarah Kaplan at the business school in at Rotman in, in Toronto. Discomfort comes from diversity. So did diverse teams feel discomfort? And anybody who's had a group of students who come from different countries who maybe don't all speak English as their first language. So I've got 120 students in one of my classes and I asked them, this is downtown Toronto, I asked them, how many of you speak another language other than English? English might be your second or it could be your third or fourth language. How many of you speak another language? And about 60% of them put up their hands. So different, if you have groups with different languages, sometimes you have to work harder to be understood. And so when you have diverse teams, it doesn't be language, it can be people from different cultures. It can be people from different, you know, all sorts of different kind of perspectives. And sometimes it's harder and there's discomfort and you have to work harder. But the data tell us that you get better outcomes and you get better outputs. So embedding equity and delivering on diversity and achieving real inclusion by using all the talent means you actually get better outcomes. We should all want that. Even people from the dominant group, even the people that have power and privilege, who might feel like they're being threatened or they're being attacked, should want this. They should want better outcomes. So I just want to go back to the British Antarctic Survey because that's where it started out. And I will never go back there. But uh, it's interesting that this organization is now an award-winning organization in terms of embracing human talent. They have won awards for um, ability, for LGBTQ um, safe place to work for Athena Swan and they now say they, they actively and intentionally value and leverage diversity and inclusion in all its various areas of work and it's now a very pr um, productive place to actually go work. It's important to recognize that I didn't change. 12 year old girls who now go to open houses will be told yeah of course we want you, of course we want you not because they're trying harder or people are telling them, get interested in science, because the system finally recognized that it was missing talent. That's what we want to be achieving. It took them 30 odd years, but it's a slow iterative process. Thank you very much for your attention. Lots more resources here. And that little girl in the middle is my icon, just holding that owl like a, like a boss. Yeah. Thank you.